I'm very excited to introduce Kay today. She's a VFX artist at Mr. X in Toronto, Canada. She's got a really interesting career. She has a passion for researching science and she works at the intersection of the world of science and visual effects. She also runs a VFX site for artists to better understand Houdini, which is also her passion. And uh, she's appeared, or she's worked on, excuse me, a number of TV productions, including Umbrella Academy, The Boys, Chaos Walking, Bad Boys for Life. Um, she's known for her Houdini user group events on scientific design. And on top of this, she works as a VFX writer for companies in the UK. So Kate, you somehow figured out how to get more than 24 hours in a day. We're gonna to have to talk about that and, and learn your trick for that. Um, let's get started, Kate. We're, we're excited to meet you and I'll give you the quick Grid Markets overview first. Grid Markets is a cloud rendering service. We uh, support all the major renders, which you can see there on the left, including Houdini and uh, the major, uh, sorry, the, the, the major 3D packages as well as the major renderers. The key features of our service are, it's very simple to set up. It takes a, a few minutes to do that with, uh, with a download, which I'll explain in a moment. And you can submit from your favorite 3D uh, software. Nothing new to learn. You can employ between one to a hundred machines or more, depending on, on your urgency. Um, we have a pay per use model, uh, which allows you to do budgeting as well. So if you have a limit that you want to spend, you can incorporate that in your submission. Uh, and the platform is supported 24 by seven by artists like you. So we'll help you get your job across the line. Um, it's secured by the Oracle Cloud. How it works, uh, first you sign up, go to gridmarkets.com, sign up. Um, and create an account for yourself. It's, it takes a few seconds to do that. Once you've done that, then there will be a download option, uh, a tool called Envoy, which we've created. Envoy uh, is responsible for moving your files to and from um, your local machine and our cloud. Once you have downloaded Envoy, in, inside that is a plugin, which uh, you can then install. In this case, since Kate is a Houdini artist, um, she would install the Houdini plugin and after doing so, she would be able to submit directly from Houdini to us. So she would identify her project file or Houdini project file in this case that she wants to submit to us. And then that up it would go to our cloud and it would start rendering using the appropriate render that she was using. She uh, at this point would specify her machine count and what machine configuration she wants to use and off it would go. Uh, once we receive it, we then provide a real-time dashboard, which here's a, a snapshot of it. It shows um, all the projects that Kate is working on at the moment and the state of those projects. She can click on any one of those projects and drill down into the, um, uh, the individual frames that make up that project and also go into the logs of those frames. As the frames are completed, they are then returned to her back to the folder that she designates. Um, there's no waiting. Once the frames complete, they start downloading. And if you're interested in a free trial, you can go to gridmarkets.com sign up. We'll give you a 15% discount on anything you buy. Use this promotion code here. All right, enough for me. Let's get over to Kate now. All right, Kate, uh, let's get started. It really, as I said, really excited to, to have you today. Very impressed with your work. Um, and I think everyone's going to be really interested in your story. So let's, uh, let's get started with an introduction. Kate, go ahead. My name is Kate Zacharis. I kindly, I work as an EFX artist at Mr. X in Toronto, and I've been in the effects industry for close to three years. Um, and I've worked in with Houdini for just over four. And I've also graduated from Humber College in Toronto in 2019 from their 3D animation program. Um, before we go any further, I'll show you some of the work that I've worked on. Um, hopefully all of this work will have an update in December, uh, but no sneak peeks yet. So I'll showcase just sure some of the real, yeah? <laughs> some of the work that I've worked on. These are productions that I worked on maybe a year and a half, a year ago, but they're still pretty cool.
as you can kind of see that my previous workplace, uh, they really specialized me in particle effects, uh, which was really co cool of them to do. Um, and it led to some very interesting simulations. Uh, but let's kind of get into like the general the gist of who I am as an artist and kind of what I do um, as a whole in the VFX industry. So let's dive into that. As I've talked about, um, I work at for Mr. X in Toronto and I graduated from Humber College. You might kind of know me from my work and my blog called uh, <laughs> More VFX Help or uh, my YouTube channel where I produce free tutorials. Um, a cool fact about me is that when I, I graduated from Humber College, I was the first of 10 artists to graduate in VFX. And I was also the first female artist to do so from that program because their 3D animation program didn't really allow for many people to go through into visual effects. And now I also do teaching uh, and mentoring for them as well. In fact, uh, this upcoming January, I'll be teaching at Humber College and their formal VFX program. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that, but more on that later. So I also do run a Discord group for scientific visualization in Houdini, as well as write articles for F-Track um, and teach for CG Spectrum Houdini School and guest lecture for several other universities. And in the past, I've also worked as a LRC artist or for a lighting rendering comp artist for other animation studios. So just a little bit more about me. Uh, VFX was never something I was really planning to work in. It just sort of happens. Uh, back in the day, I wanted to go back, go to school for my astrophysics degree, and I wanted to work for the Canadian Space Agency. And I was really interested in just astrophysics and the universe as a whole. Uh, but then some major life events happened, and I found myself in visual effects. So by major life events is I was really questioning what I wanted to do as a person, whether or not my dream was to go into astrophysics or was that the dream other people were creating for me. And that was a huge debate in the back of my mind. But by the end of it, I decided animation was something I had to look into. So I didn't really learn much about what visual effects was until three months before my last year of college. And then I fell in love with Houdini and I looked into it more. My first industry jobs were as a lighting written compositing artist. And I worked for this as a few different animation companies. And I will say I have a new appreciation for all our comp or lighting artists out there because that's a job I just can't do. You guys keep killing it. Um, <laughs> I'll just do the simulations. So it really wouldn't be till September of 2019 that I'd start to work as a full-time VFX artist or effects artist. So actually simulate explosions and smoke and clouds and all that good stuff. And from there, I'd work on some mainstream shows such as Netflix shows, such as Umbrella Academy, as well as a few theatrical releases. And when I was working on my first VFX job, I would start to create what a lot of people and artists know now as my main VFX blog, More VFX Help. And this blog morphed out of some Houdini notes that I had from college where I was just struggling to put everything together as an artist and I had zero resources to look into. And as well as a backlog of articles that I was creating as a visual effects database for some coworkers, but more on that later. Now I mainly work for Mr. X in Toronto and I work on some pretty amazing productions, hopefully that I, you will see in the future. I will probably make an update about that when they pop into existence. So keep your eyes out. So over the years, I've been an avid researcher in the overlap between science and visual effects. I mostly run a Houdini blog on my site that contains most of my notes and information regarding of what I found over the years. And it's grown a fairly big following as well, um, I'd like to think. I am enjoying the feedback I'm getting from it. And there's been a lot of people who have stepped out of their way to help me out and given their feedback on the site. And I'm continuing <laughs> to upgrade it when I can. My main goal is to make scientific visualization and knowledge more accessible to artists in the film, TV, and game side of the industry. I've personally run into several artists that would love to learn and incorporate clients into Houdini and their visual effects, but I have no idea what to look for and how to start. So I also find just looking into science is also a great way to prevent burnout and VFX. Uh, because it forces you to explore other industries and learn something new. And so I think scientific visualization and just the scientific industry can help us as a whole even more. On my site, I try and collect everything from general Houdini knowledge, open source 3D software and scientific papers and data. 
For every article I do, I try and make sure whoever's reading it understands the basics of whatever they are reading, whether that is astrophysics or something very specific such as chaos theory. And I will first break down the topic that I'm discussing, mention the scientific software that is used in the field, break down any scientific papers that are related to that topic, and then finally relate it back to VFX. And I mentioned previously that I first started to create this site as like a database for my own personal VFX notes, but it's also a database for my, going to be a database for my coworkers. And this first kind of started me writing this when I was, uh, when I first started writing about VFX and science, I was working at a studio in Toronto and at this studio almost every week, I was told that I was going to burn out. Um, I was told from week one, I was told, give yourself six months, see how you feel because they, because I was so new, I think the main concern of the staff was that the hyperness will fade, the excitement will fade, and then you'll suddenly realize what your job is. Um, so it was very shocking to me that it's something I love could make me burn out, but I certainly realized that that could have could be a possibility. And so I was really looking for a way to make that not happen. And it was fortunate that in my first week of that studio, my supervisor said, hey, Kate likes making tutorials. Why don't she make us some Houdini tutorials for us? And I kind of left it, he kind of left it as like an open-ended question, but I, I really jumped at it and I started making something in the background as well as incorporating what I was curious about and what I knew about. And this happened to be scientific visualization. And this research in a way really helped me not fall into that gap of burnout. And it really motiv motivated me to bring something new to the table. Um, and it was kind of unfortunate that COVID happened because I never really got to show them what I made um, as I was kind of saving it for an upcoming contract review that never happened. Uh, but I'm also very thankful in a way that I was forced to branch out and go to other workplaces and discover new things and grow as, a, as an artist. So in some ways it's a very bittersweet moment for me, but it was also a good learning moment as well. There are further benefits with blending science and visual effects together. There's a good argument to be made that science and VFX wouldn't exist without science and visualization is a key ingredient when it comes to promoting and imaging what we don't yet know about the universe, as well as giving back to the scientific fields can help our industry in the film and gaming world grow as a whole and also vice versa. Um, in a perfect world, I would love to see every studio bring build something Main, for mainstream audiences that accurately really represent science and film. And simply because we are storytellers, uh, even though we work with a device that is designed to help tell a story, we can still exploit that to the fullest degree to incorporate reality into it the best we can and make it interesting. Um, so we have an opportunity to learn from what we know from science and also teach other people to learn when they're sitting in a theater or playing a game. It would also be worthwhile in my opinion to have more films to teach people about what they are experiencing in real life. But by the end of the day, um, we do need to represent our client's vision and what our client's artistic vision is and as well as the story we're representing. And sometimes our own cre cre creativity will have is not exactly what the story needs and which most of the time, and this process just most of the time involves making the shot work for the sequence. So most of the effects we do in the movie industry are not physically accurate, uh, but we do want to make them look realistic. So it's just finding that fine line, but seeing where we can improve it in the future. I actually, on a little bit of a side note, I have a great story from my HOD where he was filming the story where he had to make a realistic underwater explosion. The client specifically asked for it. And he's like, okay, we can do it. Let's power it down, let's get it done. And he goes, uh, six months later, the client took another look at it and goes, this is boring, make something else. So often when you try to do something realistic, it looks boring. And I think that's one of the main things holding us back from a client side perspective of science in film. So part of cataloging and writing about the effects in science is making sure everyone at all levels of the industry can be aware and open to new ideas and where we should push ourselves as artists. And I also say having a team of artists for whichever industry that is using Houdini or effects to showcase something, it benefits them highly to know sometimes it's not impossible to build something complex and you don't have to fake it to make it look good. 
by educating artists and people in production about higher scientific concepts, we can also start to lead their curiosity and make a production more interesting. So one way to do this um, is to make the exhausting projects fun. There are many projects I could point to in my life where I go, this should have been done three years ago, but it's not, and we're still working on it. <laughs> but yes, those projects can be so exhausting to artists that they never really go away. And these projects can often lead people in the production to burn out, take extended time off, or exit the industry to altogether, which can be very damaging to an entire team. Uh, so if we say, let's say on a production, we were to build something complex, like that's we know is not going to be done in a month, maybe six months, maybe eight months. So something maybe like a black hole or a wormhole. So instead of running up to the VFX team and telling them to punch out a bunch of different versions of something at, for temp by Thursday, uh, <laughs> we don't have to, uh, and telling them we need something now, uh, we can say there, we can use other tactics to prevent this, such as bringing in a scientist to talk to the team or providing broken down scientific visualizations and documentation of the object before it is built and creating a database of resources so we can find those examples better and or even building our own databases of files to use over and over again and anything that we can do in our spare time at work when we're not working on shots to make our lives better in the future so it's pretty much make your team excited for the next task and keep that excitement level up so there's no burnout. So also making sure your team is a welcoming and learning team and make encouraging a welcoming and learning atmosphere is also a great way to build uh, more responsibility and excitement in a team. Um, and it's also a really good way to learn from each other and keep a team together longer. Houdini is used a lot outside of visual effects for film, specifically it used, as we've discussed, in scientific visualization. One of the reasons it, for this is because of how it can be integrated with Python code and data sets very efficiently. And some example of Houdini being used outside the film, outside of film can be seen at NASA, the California Academy of Sciences, with professors at Ryerson University, and here in Canada, other places here in Canada, and much more. NASA enjoys Houdini so much that they have one of their own visualization experts and the original Houdini scientist, I would say, uh, Catalina, and she helped create this tool called YT. And YT is the official Houdini tool set for astrophysical visualization. And it's quite useful when it comes to tutorial files and Python code and how to use the software better when it comes to science. Houdini is also quite used in the medical rendering fields very frequently as there is multiple examples of it being used. And so much so that there are free available medical data sets of, that you can use as well. An example of this is the Houdini medical tool set on GitHub. There are also many independent artists out there using Houdini in the medical field. Um, one, as well as educating the community as a whole, uh, one of them being an artist named Stuart, who runs a channel called Biocinematics. I would love to tell you Stuart's last name, but I was unable to find it. I'm very sorry, Stuart but keep up the good work. Um, he proves that Houdini can be used to correctly model and simulate accurate representation of carbon nanotubes, acne filaments, and other particles in the human body and on a molecular bio biology level. So following Stewart's lead, there are also other open source artists such as Intagma that have showcased how you can build protein structures with viruses such as SARS with the software. And these medical renderings are very fast and easy to achieve with a software such as Houdini. And it's proven that you can take data from the RCSB protein data bank and animate changes in the data successfully. The RCSB protein data bank is an online international resources for scientists and curious people to explore protein structures. And on this site, they have downloadable VDB structures that almost anyone can use. So outside of this, I have other career ventures that I've been up to. Um, <laughs> so outside the studio, I also participate in other Houdini related work and VFX activities, as well as personal blog work out, outside of my site. One activity I've been diving into is with F-Track for close to two years now, we've been writing Houdini related content. And part of what we've been trying to do with the articles is bring 
Houdini practices and workflows into the community, as well as promote healthy working practices and VFX and general knowledge, as well as supervisor level knowledge. So people can enter those positions more successfully and also have a better background when it comes to uh, using the software. Another activity I've been doing is lecturing for universities around the world. A few weeks ago, I was able to sit down with a few students from Auckland and Syracuse University and give them a better insight into the industry as well as how to enter it successfully. It was really promising to sit down with these students halfway across the world that places I have personally never visited before and get their own take of what they thought visual effects was. And it was very eye-opening eye, eye and to see how the different teaching styles from two different universities were coordinating and how they were similar and what was different was also very interesting. So I can't wait to do that again. Teaching is a huge part of what I do as an artist. And I think it's extremely critical for artists in the effects industry to educate future, future students and future coworkers. Often schools have gaps in their knowledge and in their programs as a whole. And by guest lecturing, mentoring students one-on-one -on -one, and teaching, we can make sure they enter the workforce force fully, fully prepared. And not only does it benefit the students, but it also helps you personally as an artist. And I would argue every artist should volunteer or at least have teaching experience in their career and because it forces you to reconsider how you communicate about projects and problems and work with people you would normally never interact with. And it increases your problem solving skills. And I would also say by contributing to teaching as a whole, you can actually, uh, your workplace also benefits because you can sit down in a classroom and you can see, okay, I want to work with that student or this student would be good at my studio and you can forward them into the studio. So it not only benefits you, but it benefits the company you're working with as well because they have a never sub ending supply of artists. So it's also a really great way to force yourself to socialize in effects. And especially from a work from home environment, you can lock yourself away and close yourself off only to your work. And so teaching gives you a mandatory schedule where you have to lead a team, you have to open yourself up to new ideas and you have to see different approaches for effects. Um, currently I teach at Houdini School and CG Spectrum and as well as Humber College this January, as I've mentioned, and they are amazing schools. And they have a very unique teaching style that are fun to adapt to. Houdini School is pretty amazing. It allows for artists around the world to take specific effect courses for extremely reasonable rates. And they have both live sessions and some pre-recorded ones. CG Spectrum is a little bit different where they have a mandatory Q&A every week with the students and pre-recorded content for students to learn from. Part of what I also have to do as a teacher is help plan and build curriculums. So recently I've had the opportunity to assist CG Spectrum in an up and coming program that is incredibly unique. I'd love to tell you about it, but it's a little bit top secret right now. So I can't wait to share that with you in the future. Uh, right now I'm also helping Humber College develop a curriculum for a Houdini centered program, which will hopefully be premiering in fall of 2022. Um, this program will center around the basics of Houdini, teach pipeline and production skills, problem solving for VFX and much more. It has been a joy to develop it and get feedback from the supervisors and head of departments at studios to see what they are looking for junior artists. Um, we are aiming to fit something that will develop the needs of VFX studios in Toronto, as well as produce artists that will have the confidence to succeed. So what we're really trying to do is go up to studios and say, hey, we're designing this program. Uh, what do you need six months from now? And they tell us the requirements that they're looking for for artists six months from now, or maybe a year from now when they have products down up the line and say, okay, we can train students to do that. So that's what we're trying to do with this program. We're also going to be hopefully inviting industry guests to come to talk to the students. And for our pipeline and production class, we're also going to be teaching the students how to use like render farms and how to you know, communicate with the production effectively because you often don't understand what production is until you work at a studio. So we thought those things were important to incorporate. So over my career, I've had the opportunity to contribute to two Houdini user group events. And the first is blending VFX and scientific visualization. And the second abstract hydrodynamics in Houdini. The first Houdini hug I worked on, uh, I had two weeks to slam something together and it was a tense few weeks, but it turned out fairly well. Uh, very funny story. Uh, I found out that I was participating in it 
at, I think, 12 a.m. in the morning. I got an email asking me if I was interested, and I didn't sleep for the rest of the night because I was so excited. I just jumped on my computer and started brainstorming. So that's kind of how it happened. So thank you, Deb. Um, I think it turned out very well, but as it sounds from the name, the first presentation was about the advancements of Houdini is doing with helping out in the scientific field, as well as what, well as artists, what we can do to help with that. The second presentation was a little bit more tricky. Me and my friend David attempted to build a planetary atmosphere in Houdini, and we were able to create something interesting, but we learned very quickly that rendering something that huge, such as a planetary atmosphere, takes a huge amount of time, and it's a very difficult task at best. And setting up lighting passes is a huge part of it. And we were able to simulate and render an atmosphere similar to Jupiter's. We also talked about how gas, about how gas giants work in the process. So a little bit more detail about that presentation. Um, we had a little bit more time to plan it. So we had, I think, two months. So it took a month. I was doing the research for it. So I researched I had like at one point a 16 page document about how the chemical composition of atmospheres is and how that plays a part in the heat of the planet and everything. Um, and then my friend Dave put everything together into a file and tried to mimic the pictures as well as based on the chemical compositions that I forwarded to him, try to simulate the colors based on, you know, the iron composition or the hydrogen in the atmosphere and things like that. Uh, we took a good stab at it. I think we could have done better, but you know, it was a work in progress and we did what we had to do. But after the Houdini Hug event, we posted these files online uh, on my site for others to collaborate on as well as make atmospheres of their own. Um, so that's kind of what we did as like a general kind of here Houdini community, what would you like to do with this file? Make, make a planet, uh, do a dune atmosphere or something. So they're still available if you want to download. Uh, on my blog. So when I first started maintaining this blog, kind of sliding back to it um, and posting content, one thing I kind of noticed is that there wasn't very much information on the history of the effects. I only found one blog that was about the history of map painting. And that was very fascinating to me, but I couldn't really find anything that was really, really centered around effects in VFX. So I really felt kind of empowered to kind of look into it in my own time. So I didn't really know what to look for, but I knew the questions that I kind of wanted answered, such as who was the first effects artist? When did the VFX start in Canada? Um, what is Canada's like highest grossing VFX maybe? Because I, I grow, I'm currently located in Canada and I've grown up in Canada all my life. So I was very curious of how the industry here got started. Long story in short, in, in, in Toronto, as far as I'm aware, and maybe someone can correct me on this if I have it wrong, but from what I've been able to dig up, it kind of started with the animation industry blooming in Toronto. And it kind of started when Nelvana just came up here, set up shop, and then a bunch of other smaller studios spawned out from what my own basic understanding is just from a Toronto perspective. So that's kind of interesting um, historically wise. So another reason why I wanted to do this is that most junior artists starting out in the industry doesn't really know what's going on and they don't know too much knowledge about the productions that happened before them as well as what the industry was like 20 years ago so bringing them up to speed can also help them fit into the working environment faster so when i started looking into this um and documenting everything i created two different pages and these pages turned into the history of women in vfx and a spotlight a spotlight article on the canadian vfx industry So these, as I've mentioned, these topics are too close to home for me when I'm Canadian and when I'm a VF, female VFX artist. And I really wanted to look in the history of females in VFX because there isn't a lot out there. And I really wanted to see like when we started joining the industry. So it was a very fascinating journey to look in that. And I recommend you go to my site and read them. Um, so some highlights of what I found um, is that the first ever VFX artist or founder of compositing techniques was most likely the first female director, Alice Guy. There's a few films that they've been able to discover of hers recently in France, where she uses very light compositing techniques to like kind of flatter her films a bit. Um, and so you could almost consider her a compositor. 
uh, the first ever computer programmer was a woman and the first ever wo woman person to own a personal home computer as well was a female as well. And she was, I think, one of the founding members or founding workforce or I of IBM. I don't, I, I think so. There's a great New York Times article about it and I totally recommend you read it. They throw it out of the ballpark. Uh, the highest grossing VFX film in Canada is actually Resident Evil Afterlife, which I found very fascinating because I work for the studio that helped do the VFX for it. So I was like, oh, that's super cool. Um, uh, Canada is also very uh, centered around 3D software. So Houdini and programs like A Alias work founded in Canada as well. So one thing I do still participate in after looking into all of that is I still like making free tutorial content. And I love the fact that a large part of the Houdini community is open source and that we can learn and grow from each other. I first started making tutorials back in 2018, 2019, and I mainly focused on clouds, such as how to build an accurate cloudscape or how to animate clouds. And from there, um, those cloud tutorials took off and it started to be shared around the internet. So now I try to make ones that appeal to junior artists, particle effects, and science behind some of the systems and updates to the software. So I also run a scientific design in Houdini Discord, uh, where I try and bring mo scientifically motivated people in Houdini together. And so far we are creating databases for collecting reference scientific tool sets for Houdini and much more. And we also share the latest Houdini news, scientific papers, and share skills. So if you'd like to join, I can add the link to the chat later and feel free to check it out. So the kind of goal of my career, I am not really sure where I want to end up in the future. I love scientific visualization, um, but I also love film. So I'm in this very great middle zone right now, but it's also a middle, zo middle zone of, I know I can't be here forever. So which route do I choose? Um, so I'd love to have maybe a role making effects builds for films that are scientifically accurate and working with clients that they can help understand science. I think this would be a very hard thing to do, but I also think it would be a great experiment to try in the right studio. Um, but I'd also like to take on more freelance work when it comes to researching and visualizing natural phenomena. So those are two different pathways that I'm trying to decide to head down and see if they're possible. And I personally would lo love this industry and it's so hard to find a career where you do something new and different every day and that you're forced to problem solve, challenge yourself and create art, which not many jobs allow you to do. So kind of sliding back to this, now versus two years ago when I started, I can say that this industry is for changing for the better, um, but we have a long way to go. Like this job, can be very tiring and isolating and overpowering and finding a balance to do that is, to prevent that is just very hard to do and you need very good time management skills to prevent that from happening and depending on your situation as an artist it can be very easy for you to burn out so there are issues we do need to tackle globally in film but it's promising to see more companies offering mental health days and vacation and benefits and creating healthier working environments and also being called out when they've done something wrong. And I've noticed also many other women who join the ranks of effects artists, which makes me very happy. Uh, when I first started out in this industry, which I know doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was kind of a big deal for me because when I first joined studios, I'd be told, oh, you're the first woman in our effects department ever. And it was like that for almost three studios. And it was very interesting for me that that had to be commented on. Um, but it was a really good kind of wake up call for me going, okay, maybe I should buckle down and just ignore what's going on around me and just do my work. So it taught me really quickly what's a good and healthy studio environment and what's not a good healthy studio environment. So it was a learning very fast moment. And, but I think also now in Toronto, uh, especially at Mr. X, like the working environment is just so nice and it's so relaxing and, uh, I love, I'd hopefully, I I want to see this change even outside of Mr. X at different studios in the future, because it's just so wonderful to be around teams that are so happy to learn and joyous and want to participate every with each other every Friday. Um, and I also think, you know what, we still need to inject science into more productions. 
because I think it would be a great idea. And I think this would speed along the process of keeping people at studios and keeping people together as a team even more. So the more we learn, the less more likely we're gonna, going to burn out. So I hope that kind of makes sense. I've got a couple of questions for you, Kate. Um, the first one is, how do I get started in a career in scientific visualization? Ooh, that's, that's a good question because um, there's really no, we're trying to do something, there isn't a lot of schools that offer that as like a course you can take or a program you can take. So it's kind of hard to pick a university and say, can I learn scientific visualization here? Because it's more than likely that you're going to have to do a full on science degree to use it which is kind of great. It's not, it's kind of almost classified to, you know, PhD or master level students, which is changing. Uh, there's two schools that I'm working for that are trying to make programs that are accessible to artists and also people who are not artists or not scientists who come in and learn um, kind of where to start in Houdini and how to bring data sets inside of Houdini and learning more about the world around you. So. Houdini School, for example, has two courses. One is mine and one is Catalina's, uh, who I talked about during this presentation. She, so mine is about scientific phenomena. So I break, you I break down certain aspects of the world and it's very light, so it's very beginner. So if you don't know anything about science, I would say take that one. Uh, so we break down everything about the science first and then we walk through Houdini and we create the thing we were just talking about, whether that's clouds or the bottom of the ocean and things like that. Um, and then Catalina's class is kind of, hey, let's actually bring in data sets and build the realistic, like physically accurate version, which these two classes really work well together. So I would recommend kind of taking classes like that. Um, and then if you really feel excited about everything, maybe find a class, um, and there will be one in the future, hopefully, where that I know of, and I will be happy to share it with everyone when it is available, uh, that is mostly centered around physics and science in Houdini. So that, that would mean like bringing in Python data, set, data sets and coding and using VEX to create something physically accurate. So I would say if you want to go the education route, look for schools like that. Uh, but if you want to study on your own, the first thing you kind of need to do is pick the thing that you want to build, because every topic of science is very different. So we could if you want to work in molecular biology, um, kind of go and Google and have a basic understanding of how that science works and what's the actual physical basic concepts of that. Um, and then maybe look into, are there data sets and tool sets or tutorials that I could follow based around that topic available and do a, again, search for those. Um, for example, you'll probably find Stewart's channel. Uh, the other thing you can do is like go to the protein data bank and download the VDBs and then load them up into Houdini um, as they are accessible in there. And then fool around with the animations and the geometry like you would do for a regular effect. So just play around until you make something look good and go, okay, that's great. Uh, and then take another stab, look at your work and make sure you didn't change anything. Um, so yeah, start to create a demo reel by playing with the available information out there and bringing data sets into Houdini and kind of creating a reel that would kind of suit that so you can prove that what you built is physically accurate um, and you are using data sets that other companies that use scientific visualization would use. Um, and that's kind of where I would start. And like any demo reel, have your breakdowns, uh, make it interesting, have your regular contact info in there. So that's kind of what our, where I kind of start um, if you wanted to look into that. Cool beans, Kate. Yeah. All right, got another question for you, you ready? Yep. Okay. Um, this is from someone who apparently is not a Houdini user, but is interested in becoming a, a Houdini user. Um, the person is saying that he's heard that it's very, it's a very big, steep learning curve, very hard to learn Houdini. Um, would like your thoughts on that and you know how someone like that would get started with Houdini. Okay. Yeah, Houdini is it, it's a everyone um ah uh, thanks Paul. Have fun at dailies. <laughs> uh so I would say if you're going to start out with Houdini, uh the best way to do is to download Houdini non-commercial. Uh just get it on your computer. Um, and the only difference between Houdini and non-commercial and the commercial version is that there's a watermark on it when you go to render. And that's pretty much it. So everything else is the same. 
So, and also you can't use it for actual physical productions. So that's the only two differences. So I would say download it and then open, go to the side effects webpage, check out their tutorials because they have a great listing of from beginner to advanced to masterclass. And so you can select the difficulty that you choose and they sort and choose and tutorials that they deem specific and relevant enough to showcase on the website that are easy to understand. So that's where I, I would start if you're an absolute beginner and knew nothing. I will also introduce you to other tutorial artists in the atmosphere and the Houdini community. So you'll learn familiar names and you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that guy's tutorial. It was really good. The other thing I would say um, is go and read the documentation. So the one thing that kind of I started with wasn't actually learning from tutorials. I just opened up the software manual, which is documentation on the Houdini website. And I just read every single page because I, I'm more of a person who learns through reading than actual visuals. So that was kind of um, helpful to me. So I would recommend doing that as well because you know reading the instruction manual of something is better than just opening up something in front of you and having nowhere know what to know nowhere to start because like you'd never you would never build a desk if you didn't have the instruction manuals for it so i would start by reading those um and then from there i would play around with the shelf tools so you can familiarize yourself with the nodes in the software and how they're used in specific simulations so break as much things as you can when you're starting out because that's going to teach you how not to break things and then i would say after you've broken enough things start to plan out what you'd like to make as an artist. So I would say if you want to build something like a destruction shot where you want a building falling down or something crashing into a building, kind of research what you need in those elements. So whether or not the elements would be like dust, small particles, debris, um, whether that be large or small pieces of debris. So you might have to do two separate simulations, just small things like that. So you look at a project and you go, okay, it's less scary now that there's multiple tiny different parts of it. And because a bigger project can be more scary than a smaller project. So <laughs> thanks, Pierre, have fun. Um, so that would be my general advice for that. Cool, thanks, Kate. All right, we've got another question for you coming fast and furiously. Um, this one's about artificial intelligence. How can Houdini be used in artificial intelligence and how much do you think Houdini would contribute to the future virtual reality? That's interesting. Okay, so I know Houdini has already been started to be integrated with machine learning because there are some great examples out there. I think there's a Houdini Hive or Houdini user group event where Ms. Anastasia Opara explores machine learning with Houdini. So I would recommend checking that out if you haven't already watched it. It's a really good um, presentation on it. But I would say it's promising. I don't know. I don't know how well Houdini would handle artificial intelligence because once again, you it's good at handling data sets. It's good at handling Python. So you could probably write something in the software um, and there are tutorials for it. So it is possible. But I think it's really limited in the sense that um, unless Houdini has a really improved like real time interface, I don't think machine learning would really help too much because even when you're working with the software, there's always a lag when you go to sim something. So I'm not sure if AI or machine learning would really help with that or that would slow AI and machine learning down when you're teaching the machine to like simulate a smoke simulation or simulate discretion shot, um, there are, I think it's never, it's not, I don't think it'll ever like destroy VFX artist jobs, especially because um, there's always, there's also some interesting papers to say that not specifically in Houdini, but machine learning as a whole is that it knows how to get the job done efficiently, but it does it in a very boring manner. So what our jobs might be, B in the future is that we might have an AI or machine learning software simulate something, but it will be our jobs to make it look interesting. So that might be a tactic of the future and that might be something VFX is heading down the road to, but we're, I'm mildly optimistic or mildly, you know, uh, <laughs> ignoring it, I'm not sure, but 
I could definitely see that as like a possibility. And that's kind of where I kind of see it in the light future for now. I don't know what it's going to be like 20 or 30 years from now. Cool. All right, Kate. You, uh, you spoke of Houdini user groups. Can you tell me why I should join or what, what, what happens at them and what, uh, what's the value of joining a Houdini user group? I would say join as many as you can or as many that are in your area because they're great to uh, learn from. So basically what they are is often, I'll take the one in Toronto, for example, because that's probably the best explanation of it. So basically what it is, is basically a bunch of artists who come together and they listen to a presentation and they have beers and pizza and they chat about whatever they want to talk about. So you meet really interesting people there. So for example, the one at Side Effects in Toronto, so the Toronto user group, uh, they usually get the interns in and they talk about what they've been building in Houdini or the plugins that they've helped build. So you get a better understanding of what it takes to uh, develop tools in the software. And you also get to meet the Side Effects staff as a whole. So you can say hi to Jeff Wagner, or you can say hi to other people uh, that you normally wouldn't talk to. So uh, that's one of the fun aspects of about it. About it, there's also side effects. Sometimes also gives out free Houdini merch. So if you want a Houdini shirt, maybe visit a Houdini inter user group event. Um, it's also a really good way to just not only chat about the software and different developments in it. It's also a really good idea to just you know meet, meet new people in the industry and also people that from other studios as well. So yeah, I would say by joining them, it's a really good way to up your social life in the industry. And it's usually just once a month too. So it's not every other week. So it's very manageable to plan out ahead of time to take part in. Great. All right, Kate, this is our last question. We're gonna wrap up here soon. But um, the question is, what do you see as the biggest barrier for a new artist to get into the industry? I think this is a question around how do you get started? Uh, maybe this person has recently graduated and is looking to break into a role like you have done. What would be your advice? I'd say the biggest barrier can sometimes be communication because every artist has a different way of communicating of like, uh, especially when it comes to job interviews or filling out job applications or even on your resume or when it comes to portfolio, portfolio work. So I would say your employer is not only judging your work, but it's all, they're also judging how well you are respectable to them and how you will treat the working environment uh, when you step into it. So a good person interviewing you will assess kind of your personality and say, hey, um, and be less saying, okay, maybe this matches other personalities in our office or in our working space. So it will be a good fit for them. And that's kind of also what they're looking for when they talk to you. So usually when you've made it to the inter interview level, it's not really about your demo reel anymore. It's about you. So you're not marketing your demo reel, you're marketing yourself at that stage. So that's always something that I would consider when you're breaking into the industry. So. Uh, Rolling back over to communication, it's always really good to be um, marketing yourself in a very professional way. So if you want to communicate updates of, let's say you haven't gotten a job yet, but you're still looking and be like, I update, I have a demo reel. I finally have a demo reel, um, posting it and saying, this is what my demo reel was six months ago versus now, check out the difference see how I've grown, I'm improving as an artist. So as long as you keep reminding people that you're improving and you're growing as a person, they're more likely to hire you because they know what, that they can trust that six months from now or maybe a year into your contract, you're gonna be an amazing artist. So keep communicating that and keep marketing yourself as someone who learns, who's excited to learn, I would say is one way to break into the industry. Great. Hey, Kate, I think some folks are interested in connecting with you. Um, I think you mentioned that you were going to offer uh, a way of doing that. Do you want to share that now? For sure. Uh, let me grab the link and I will forward it over to the group. There we go. That should be it. All right, super. And I'll, I'll share that as well. Okay. So Kate, Kate as, uh, as I thought it would be a very interesting presentation, you got to, you got to, very inspiring career, lots of good advice for our audience. Um, you do a lot to contribute back to the community. Um, you know, that's, that's really awesome. So hats off to you. And thanks for being our guest today.
a reminder to everyone, if you're interested in trying out grid markets, here's a pro promo code that you can use to get some free credits and a 15% discount. Uh, you get free credits when you sign up and this will give you uh, the discount on top of that. So use that promo code when you sign up or if you already have an account, just drop us an email with this promo code and we'll honor the 15% discount as well. Okay, so we have another webinar coming up. It's on December 6th and it is with uh, Yellow Brick. Uh, really interested in this webinar because uh, Yellow Brick uh, have two very interesting brands. Um, Artella is one of those and Animation Mentor is the other. And if you didn't know, Yellow Brick is an online learning and collaboration platform. It empowers the next generation of talent to discover and pursue their careers. So we, we were talking today a bit about that. Um, so this is another way to get your career started. Uh, and as I mentioned, Yellow Brick own Animation Render and recently acquired Artella. So we're gonna hear about that. Uh, Animation Render has an alumni community of over 5,000 students in over 100 countries. And those students have gone on to work at places like Pixar, DreamWorks, IOM, Weta, and others. So um, if you're interested in learning, in this case, about Houdini and, and other solutions as well, um, you should attend this webinar. You can do so on December 6th, and you can go and sign up at gridmarkets.com slash webinars. So there you have it, everyone. We're going to bring it to a close. Thanks again for joining today. Thank you again, Kate, for your time. Thanks. It was awesome. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.